Hi. In this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about how one can leverage legacy infrastructure that's agnostic of um, Kubernetes from within Kubernetes to potentially discover new physics. My name is Clemens, and I'm a particle physicist at CERN. I'm working on the CMS experiment, which is one of the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider in the Franco-Swiss area, very close to Geneva in Switzerland. In this photo on the right hand side, you can see me standing right next to the accelerator. So you can see in blue the dipole magnets. These are there to actually bend the particle beams. So that they go around in circle. So, and this circle actually has a circumference of 27 kilometers and it's a, it's a kilometer underground. And you can see here a Lego model of the LHC, obviously much smaller. But here's one of um, the experiments that's particularly interesting or dear to me, which is uh, here in red. That's the CMS detector, which is recording the collisions by the LHC, and I'm analyzing these data. So the field that I'm working is called uh, high energy physics in short tap, and it's all about trying to understand the smallest building blocks of matter. So as I said, the particle detectors such as the CMS detector, they record these collisions, and the LHC actually provides up to 40 million collisions per second and uh, the, the detector, you can imagine it as some kind of uh, digital camera. So that means uh, it's actually taking photos of, of the collisions. And that's happening 24-7 almost all year long. And you can see one of those photos that is taken or that has been taken on the right hand side. Um, so the particle beams come in from uh, both sides. And then in the very center of the detector, the particle beams are brought into collision. And then uh, these sprays of particle develop here, um, which are, you know, lots of uh, particles. They're very close together. And these particles that we are investigating, they're actually um, thinner than, than um, a hair. And the camera is actually a bit, bit, a bit bigger than uh, a standard uh, digital camera. It's, um, the, so the CMS detector, it weighs 14,000 tons has a height of uh, 15 meters and a length of 21 meters, and it uh, has around 100 million channels. So that's uh, effectively around 100 megapixels. Um, and these uh, particle um, detectors, I mean, they're a bit better than your digital camera, which might also have 100 megapixels because they can take 40 million, second, uh, 40 million photos per second. So because there's one collision every 25 nanoseconds. And this is so much data that we can actually not store this immediately. We have to... Um, do something special. We have to filter things as quickly as possible, largely based on hardware, and then later on also based on, on uh, software. And we can store up to a thousand of such photos uh, per second for later analysis. And this analysis, since we're running all year long, um, is then a big data analysis. So we are actually analyzing tera to petabytes of, petabytes of data using C++, uh, Python, and also shell scripts for the plumbing. For this kind of analysis, we really need to have a big infrastructure. And this is provided by the worldwide LHC computing grid, which consists of around 170 computer centers all around the world. You can see that on the right hand side here. Um, so the data, they're accumulated at CERN. So that's the tier zero. And then they're, they're distributed, um, they're reconstructed and then distributed uh, to the different sites all around the world. So you can see the tier one sites that have particularly high bandwidth links to the tier zero. They're, you know, for instance, in Russia, in, in Italy, in Germany, in the UK, in the US, and all kinds of places. And um, then there are around 160 further sites, the so-called tier two sites, that also, you know, have parts of the data. That's distributed so that we can send our analysis jobs to the grid and analyze the, the, um, the, the data where they're actually located. And there are even more smaller batch farms, so-called tier threes. They're then local and uh, limited to those working at these, for instance, research institutions. And at and all these sites, they are often already managed using Kubernetes. And at CERN, we have a slightly bigger local cluster. So uh, we have a batch farm that's uh, running on HT Condor, a high throughput computing software for batch computing. And there we have 230,000 cores. And that allows up to 150,000 jobs to run simultaneously. And uh, that results in about or a maximum of 1.4 million jobs that are completed per day. Now, the, these um, 
grid sites, they are largely there for the, you know, large scale processing. Um, and uh, most of these steps are already um, automated. So, you know, from actually reconstructing the data that we've taken um, uh, and also having the associated simulation that we compare the data to a process, this is all automated. But the part that is still pretty manual is actually the so-called high level physics analysis. So this is some uh, an analysis that tries to address a specific phys physics question. So for instance, when we were searching for the Higgs boson, you know, there were several analyses trying to find the Higgs boson, eventually it worked out. Uh, but this is something that is a somewhat manual process at this point, because it needs a lot of very detailed inputs that come that are provided from um, several um, groups and individuals from within the collaboration. So, so for instance, uh, calibration constants and factors and corrections, uh, certain uncertainties, etc. They, they are all um, provided by the group, and one has to collect them in order then to provide or perform the final analysis. So this is pretty uh, complicated and therefore um, a challenging task to uh, to achieve. And uh, we can actually, you know, keep track of all this thanks to version control. So we're using Git. Um, and so we can capture the implementation. And to execute these jobs, we can also make use of uh, software images. So effectively, Docker containers in this case. The challenging part is now, uh, once you've captured the software, so you have the software under version control, uh, and you, you, you then build a container, for instance, using continuous integration. Uh, we're using GitLab mostly for that. Uh, so you have all the um, dependencies included in your container. Then you still need to know how you actually execute this container or this image. Um, so we also need to capture the commands. That's you know, also doable, but the big challenge lies in actually capturing the full uh, workflow. So how do we connect the individual analysis steps? And for those, there are several tools under investigation, and some of them are already used by um, smaller groups. I just want to point out a few here. So there's, for instance, a, a project uh, at CERN that's called Rihanna. That's a common workflow language uh, implementation. I mean, it uh, has a app focus, but it's also possible to use it for other um, things. Then there's Yadic, which is really focused on, on uh, app only and then uh, but there are also tools that are very you know general purpose for instance luigi that uh, has originally been developed uh, by spotify um, and that's also be, uh, being used by a few groups and uh, i asked myself the question can we actually do um, this kind of high energy physics uh, workflow processing in a cloud native way and uh, for that for workflows in kubernetes i found uh, argo workflows and uh, this seems to be a really nice tool to use so now, before I actually um, go into implementing a workflow um, from my high energy physics in Argo, I first wanted to talk to you about my cluster. So at CERN, we um, can actually um, provision clusters on-prem uh, with OpenStack. And then we have um, some additional plugins that are somewhat CERN specific so uh, or high energy physics specific. So there's a CERN VM file system so that we can e efficiently cache the software, which is you know, quite a lot. So it's actually gigabytes of software that we um, need need to use. Um, for And um, for the block storage, we have a file system. So that's that's uh, in particular for the big data sets there for which we use EOS. My cluster itself here is actually pretty small. It has um, four nodes with four cores each, and uh, the, these have uh, eight gigabytes of RAM. I have some um, object storage and also some uh, block storage. So S3 and ZFS and 300 gigabytes are sufficient uh, to store, for instance, the um, output. Um, so that's the final product uh, from the big uh, data sets uh, on, on, on disk uh, for, for, for later um, and you know, an analysis. This cluster runs on Kubernetes uh, version 118.2. And um, with this, what happens inside the cluster, I, I actually manage via GitOps. That's, um, you, and, and here I'm using Argo CD. I can also put my secrets under version control by using SOPS. There's a Barbican, uh, Barbican modification, so that's the secret manager for OpenStack. And then I can deploy this using customized SOPS. Uh, there's a plugin um, for that uh, with Argo CD. Now, let's actually see uh, how um, you know a typical workflow uh, would look like um, when when. Uh, when using Argo, uh, and, and, and here, this particular example is about searching for a new signal in the data. Trick at the workflow, you can see it here is already running. There's a blue spinning wheel that shows that this is the currently um, active step, or the one that's not finished. The yellow ones are where the container is currently provisioning. We're preparing a deer for the, um, you know, to get started. So 
for the output. And then um, the workflow splits into several steps that are related to the different processes that we're an analyzing here. And uh, you, you can see that um, we immediately scatter to a large number of jobs here. So that's a nice feature of Argo that uh, you don't have to determine how many jobs you will have in the end, but you can dynamically generate this. And also you can directly observe what is happening, uh, which part of the workflow is currently running, um, you know, what is um, the status of each um, of the steps. And you can also directly observe the logs. So these are streamed uh, directly into the user interface. You can see there's lots of uh, shell scripting here. The last command was a Python script and uh, this workflow is already done. And uh, after this highly parallel step, that's usually the one that's uh, computationally most intensive, uh, we can gather our inputs. So we uh, have a couple of merge steps, then we can again scatter out to um, steps where we, for instance, have to uh, take into account systematic uncertainties that use the same inputs but run a different variation. So that it's what, something you can see at the later stages. And then at the very end, we, it all boils down to a single um, step that provides us with a final result. That's the one that we're looking at here. Um, and you can again see the logs. This time they're a bit more interesting than before. So you can see there's a fit done to the data. Um, different processes here are investigated. And then at the end, we actually get the final result, which is in this case a plot called uh, postfit.pdf. All right, that's the demo. Um, I um, cut it down from four minutes to two minutes only. Um, and I told you at the very end that there's a plot that is produced um, by a fit in actually in the end. And um, now I, we're searching for new physics here. And um, what you can see uh, on the left-hand side in, in, the, in this plot are uh, in the different colors, the different processes that actually um, you know, would end up in this particular signal region where we're searching for the signal. And uh, in the very center, in dark green, you see uh, something that's labeled as a signal. And this is what a potential new physics signal would look like. And the black markers are actually the data. So you can see already pre-fit, so before any uh, adjustment, uh, the simulation that we produced um, matches nicely with the data. Um, and uh, now the, the question that we're asking us in, in a typical physics analysis, is there any new physics signal, right? So we optimized so that we can in simulation actually see the signal. Now we have to use the data to test if there is a new physics signal. So we're running this fit that allows um, the, the individual components to adjust to the data. So the black markers won't work, but everything else allow is allowed to move. And on the right hand side, you actually see that post fit. So after the fit, uh, the data do not support the presence of the signal. So in this case, we have not discovered physics. And that's actually the case most of the time. But I mean, that's no reason to give up. And um, you know, we're still confident that we'll find f new physics in the near future. Now let me take a step back and uh, look again at the uh, example workflow here. Um, so that's a screenshot from the demo that we um, just saw. And I, I should point out that, uh, you know, this is really just a demo. A realistic physics analysis is much more complex. Usually when I run, uh, uh, you know, the first step that is here, uh, delightfully parallel, as you can see, so that has the large amounts of um, parallel jobs um, that I would usually run several hundreds of them and they would each run for several hours, if not even uh, days, depending on, on the complexity and the size of the data set that I'm analyzing. <clears throat> what's, what's really nice here about uh, Argo is that I actually uh, could scatter out um, uh, dynamically. So I could create jobs. I could define at the very beginning, I want um, you know, five jobs for this particular data set, and I want a certain other number for, for, for another step. And uh, Argo does this, and then at the end, I can collect the, the information again. And as I mentioned in the video demo, um, there, there can be later parallel steps that I can pick up again. So this uh, works really nicely. Now, what isn't so nice is that uh, life's a bit unfair, and uh, realistic physics analysis workflow can actually not be run on my cluster. Right. So, I mean, my cluster has 16 cores and um, the uh, HD Condor batch farm, it has um, 230,000 cores and 970 terabytes of memory. So uh, the question that I asked myself, if, if I want to be able to run realistic uh, cloud native workflows with Argo, um, can I actually 
somehow make use of uh, these cores in uh, HD Condor. And I, you know, because with the 16 cores, as I said, I, I, I won't get very far. And uh, I found a solution to that. And that's what I call here the HT Condor operator. So the idea is uh, to introduce an HTC job custom resource definition. You can see the, you know, the definition on the left hand side here. So there's an API version that kind is the custom resource definition. And um, then, you know, the name is HTC job. And the idea of this job is that it should mimic a classical Kubernetes job. So it needs to somehow reflect uh, running, failed, and succeeded status. And I can do that via status properties um, of this uh, resource. And in addition, I want to be able to understand what's happening inside the HT Condor batch cluster. So I can, uh, added additional fields, such as the uh, job IDs here, that uh, reflect uh, the actual job IDs within the HT Condor cluster, so that I can also, you know, monitor and, and interact uh, by using these job IDs. And this is actually not work uh, only by me, but this has largely been done uh, by Tadas Baraik, is a bioinformatics student at Vilnius University who interned with me at CERN earlier this year. Now let's uh, get back into, um, oh, let's get down into the implementation. So when you have a custom resource definition, you need to do something that acts on it. And uh, the operator, uh, uh, so in, in Kubernetes, that's done by an operator. So the, um, and we looked around a bit what kind of uh, operators uh, we could use. We looked into meta controller and then we found the operator SDK and that makes it really easy to get a Kubernetes op operator implemented and running in the first place. So we went with that. Now this operator needs to know about um, HD Condor in one way or the other. So I built a Docker container that contains the HD Condor client. And in addition, we need to authenticate to this uh, cluster. So to HD Condor, and that's uh, done by a Kerberos. And I can uh, create a Kerberos uh, token uh, via the secrets that I uh, can store in my cluster. The HD Condor operator itself is then actually installed into this container. And in addition, what this operator needs to know, it needs to translate the information from um, the job spec into something that can be executed on HD Condor. So here, um, in particular, the jobs are not executed uh, using uh, Docker when running on HD Condor, but they're executed using Singularity. Uh, so there's a translation step that um, tr you, uh, translates the image spec and the, com the, the, the script into something that is then effectively a singularity command with a script attached to it. And if we now look uh, at the implementation in, in the boxes below, you can see that in my cluster, I, I install the HTC operator that knows about, uh, the, about HD Connor and uh, has um, my credentials. When I create an HTC job, um, so it watches, the operator watches for them to be created. And as soon as there's one, it'll use the API of HD Condor to, to submit jobs to the batch cluster. And then uh, these batch jobs on, on HD Condor side will be executed. And uh, in addition to having the API implemented here, I also um, have at the very end of my job uh, webhook by a cloud events that actually tell my uh, operator that a job is done and which one is the, uh, which job is done uh, in particular, as well as this exit code, so that I can reduce the number of API queries from the HTC operator to the batch cluster. Okay, so this is the um, HTC job definition. I create a job and then it submits something. Now I have to um, make this work with Argo. And the nice thing is that Argo can actually uh, en manage any kind of Kubernetes resources. So here's a step from, from Argo. Uh, it's called generate batch. It has a couple of parameters among them, for instance, the number of jobs. And then I can say, I want to have a resource and the action for this resource should be to create it. And then I, at the very bottom, you see the beginning of the manifest and you can see that the kind of uh, resource that I want to be created is an HTC job. So now I, what I need to do in addition is I need to define some success condition that uh, determines uh, whether my jobs are all done or if any of them failed. So I define a success condition that the number of, um, so the status field in my custom resource definition uh, needs to be uh, equal to the number of uh, jobs that I started with. And if uh, any of the jobs failed, then also this job is supposed to fail. So that means now I can actually move the long running steps into HD Condor directly from my Argo workflow. So what 
I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the same workflow as before, but moving this first step to HD Condor. And um, I'm going to speed this up a bit, but let's see uh, how this goes. Okay, so I'm submitting my job from the command line. You can see it's running the prepare and dear step as before in the UI. And uh, now there, there's actually a difference here. You can see two spinning wheels after each other. And this step is actually now uh, running on the batch. So we're creating inside the cluster the custom resource. And therefore, the operator will uh, submit jobs to the batch system. And you can see that um, here on the left hand side is already happening. And also on the right hand side, there are, there are currently active zero job IDs, uh, none. And uh, as soon as the jobs are queued, you actually see active four and you see the individual job IDs, which you can compare to on the left hand side. Now, um, the in, inside Argo, the, I defined a failure condition and a success condition. So all the jobs need to be complete successfully um, so for things to move on. And I can actually investigate this in more detail. If I um, look at my uh, HD Condor operator within uh, Argo, so here I'm looking um, at the um, Argo CD uh, UI, where I also see the logs of the um, other um, pods. Um, and you can, for instance, here see the job definition. I submitted a job to Big Bird 10. Um, so this is the um, manifest for the job submission. And you can see uh, there are several of them because I actually uh, submitted a total of four batches. I also have lots of, um, I have four custom resources now defined. And now let's monitor what's happening. So the first job actually here already completed. I can again check uh, the uh, HTC um, operator. Now Cloud Events actually send us the job ID and the return code from uh, generate batch MC2. And uh, that also then automatically triggers a, a transfer of the data from the batch cluster into the um, pod file system and then uh, directly into the shared storage that I can use in subsequent steps inside the cluster again. Now, we just saw briefly uh, the Grafana monitoring, uh, but more interesting here is now actually that also the first jobs are succeeding um, in, in for, for the CR that I was uh, monitoring. And again, we see that uh, in the logs. And Grafana in green here, the jobs that are running in uh, yellow is a bit behind uh, the ones that have been uh, scheduled. You can actually see that all the jobs are running already. Um, now we're already at uh, two succeeded jobs and two active jobs. And on the left hand side, you can see the total um, 15 jobs, seven have completed, eight are running. Um, I can actually see now that 159.3 uh, is the one that uh, just uh, completed. And uh, now immediately after, um, now we already had succeeded three. Um, that's another um, job that uh, completed for this custom resource that we were watching here. And uh, in a second or so, we'll be at succeeded four and that will automatically trigger the workflow to continue. And you can see that at the bottom here. So we're already now moving on. And all the subsequent steps here are now happening inside the cluster. And you see now that 15 out of 15 jobs have been completed. And again, in the logs, we see that uh, all the data have been transferred. And also, there's now a success statement for the uh, custom resource. So Argo continues um, its job, but the custom resource stays in place. And all the other um, steps were, as before, um, pretty fast. So there wasn't much to be done. The images had been pulled already from the previous demo. So now we're already at the last step where we um, make the plot. And um, that then concludes the workflow. Now, at the very end, there's, uh, I said the custom resources remain. So if I delete the workflow, also the um, resources that were created will be deleted. Um, so you will now see on the top left that um, this will actually remove the jobs from the queue. I left them there in case I wanted to transfer some data, but I've done that automatically. So now I'm at zero almost uh, for the jobs that are um, scheduled uh, or even completed. And on the right hand side, you saw that now we get an error. No more HTC jobs um, are available and also the jobs are removed. All right, 
So this worked really well. As I said, I sped up things a bit. So this in total would have taken something like 30 minutes just because um, I'm not the only one running jobs inside the, the cluster. Um, so, and, and HD Condor, so such a cluster is not really made for short running jobs, but the short queue is actually something like 15 minutes and the default is something like eight hours. So it's, it's okay that things take it some time to, to, um, to be scared to actually run. Um, but if I ran a real physics analysis, you know, that would be perfectly fine with me. But, uh, just to, to close out, um, I, I think. You know, what, what I um, managed to show you is here that I um, uh, leveraged uh, legacy infrastructure. So, uh, you know, Kubernetes agnostic uh, computing infrastructure by means of a, a Kubernetes custom resource definition that is combined with an operator. And the operator concept is re extremely powerful for this purpose. And also, um, I've, I found that um, cloud native high energy physics workflows are possible using Argo. So that's really nice. And um, now there are a couple of steps still to be done. So the HTC operator actually needs to be made a bit more flexible because when you uh, choose queues in HD Condor, you can also directly translate, for instance, uh, compute uh, requirements. Um, so how long should your job run, et cetera. Um, in, uh, so you again need to translate what is there in Kubernetes uh, to something uh, that is um, understandable or understood uh, by HD Condor. And, <clears throat> Of course, it would be nice uh, sooner or later to also uh, make use of these uh, 170 grid sites that are available for me um, to use, so the WLCG. Um, so that's um, on the roadmap. Uh, but actually, if, if you want to see something more on this topic, there there is a presentation by uh, Alessandra Forti and uh, Lucas Heinrich, also at KubeCon here, um, who actually talk about how they uh, have their own grid site on their on their, uh, laptop. So I could, in principle, run my workflow uh, in Kubernetes, then send it to the grid where the grid would be their local laptop. So that's um, fun, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So. Thanks um, to Tadus again uh, for, for his great work. Um, I would also like to thank the Cloud Containers team at CERN. So that means in particular Thomas, uh, Ricardo, and Spiros, and um, also um, Lucas. And now I'm very happy uh, to take your questions. So thank you for your attention. Hello. So. Um, Thanks again for, for joining. I got a lot of questions in the chat. I already tried to answer a couple of them. Um, I'll just go through them uh, in the following, uh, probably the, uh, th those that are you know, the generally most uh, interesting. For, for other things, you can uh, you know, chat with me in the CNCF uh, Slack afterwards. Um, you can find me there. I'll be monitoring the, the machine learning um, channel. So. I mean, that, that was a very uh, general question on, on you know, general um, information on CERN. We actually have a, our own top-level um, domain, so you can just uh, go to home.cern, C-E-R-N, uh, and uh, from there you, you find uh, information in particular on uh, the, the CERN experiments, so the Large Hadron Collider, and also the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, but also smaller experiments that are taking place um, at CERN. Then... There was another question um, on how many Kubernetes clusters are being used at CERN and how many nodes are in the biggest cluster. I actually don't have a concrete answer to that. Um, I mean, I, I know that there are um, several hundred uh, clusters, uh, but I think that most of them are actually um, rather small. Um, and um, I know that at least one of the clusters has around 1,000 uh, cores. So you usually have, um, you know, it depends on all these are uh, set up. Uh, some, some, uh, you know, we have different flavors of the, of the VMs that, that we use of the nodes. So some of them have eight cores, uh, others have four. Um, so the, the standard would be four um, with eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, then there was another question on the storage technology that we're using to store all this data. Um, and we're actually uh, largely using EOS. And I, I put the link to EOS um, into the, in the, the um, Q&A window. Uh, you can also find it by just searching for EOS and CERN. Um, so that's a technology that's been um, developed uh, at CERN. I think it's uh, generally available. 
Um, and uh, for long-term preservation, we um, rely on tapes a lot. So for data that aren't actively used, they're actually um, copied over to tape and then um, you know, archived, and if you want to run on them, this what happened to me in the other day, then it can easily take a few days until they're actually staged out uh, to disk. And um, this archiving does not only happen at CERN, but it also happens on the different grid sites. So you can be uh, lucky um, or unlucky. <laughs> mm. Then there was another question on uh, having a link to the presentation. So um, I uploaded the presentation, a PDF of that, um, to the, the sked.com um, entry. So you should be able to find it there. And also added a PDF with the uh, two links to the demos. Um, I just uploaded them to YouTube because I wasn't sure um, if the quality would be good enough. Um, but I think um, they, they showed up nicely. So um, yeah, but still, if you want to rewatch re them um, specifically, um, feel free to do though. You can find them there with the links. Um, okay, and then there are a couple of questions um, on the workflows. Um, so the, the question was, you know, what is so specific uh, about the, the uh, high energy physics that that we might need uh, separate tools? Um, so in general, I would say that we do not really need dedicated tools. So we could actually work with the existing tools, but um, yeah, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of custom tooling. We are using also rather old systems. Um, so, you know, we're always a couple of uh, years behind with the latest, greatest software, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, you know, we can work around that uh, with containers. Uh, but still, you know, there's still the, the, the custom tooling, then we, um, you know, we, we have to um, do um, authentication. So we, we have uh, certificates, then we use Kerberos and other places and all that. All that. And um, so I mean, I'm, uh, say, one of the few people actually trying to um, you know, make um, these, these high energy physics workflows uh, accessible for uh, people uh, within the community. Um, and for that, I think it's really important to um, give them a really good experience. So to make it as easy as possible for them uh, to uh, you know, get started um, with, um, let's say, cloud native or automated uh, workflows. And also, uh, yeah, actually stay as close as possible to, let's say, some, some um, industry or um, open uh, source uh, solution that, that can be used because, um, you know, otherwise uh, I would have to do all the maintenance and that's uh, probably not what I want to do. But um, yeah, so the, the custom tooling is mostly just around, um, for instance, um, the scatter gather paradigm. So we, you know, we have a couple of data sets, but a data set actually contains a couple of um, uh, thousand files. And then you want to parallelize this in a, in a, in a dynamic way. So, uh, and then afterwards you want to, uh, uh, collect this again, but you don't want to collect all the files in one step, but you want to do this in some kind of a cascade. Um, and that's uh, something that's maybe a bit more um, have specific. So if this could be abstracted away from the, the user, so the, the physics analyst, uh, that, that, that's something uh, useful. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, about the choice of the workflow tool, um, uh, I just went with Argo because I had, you know, I found it a few years back and, and I was actually curious, like, could, could we use it? I, I mentioned in the presentation, there are other tools, for instance, uh, Luigi, and probably Airflow is an equally good um, s solution. Uh, it just needs someone to actually um, give this a try and, and see um, if, if that works for them. Um, okay. So, um, So there are a couple of uh, other questions. Um, so I mean, at, at, so there, there, there's a question whether whether we actually now completely switched uh, to Kubernetes, and I'm actually actually have to say we were um, only really getting started with Kubernetes. I mean, the, the, our IT department is you know heavily invested in, in Kubernetes, um, but let's say all the jobs that we're running are still running on uh, HD Conda or Slurm or other platforms where we can execute uh, containers, uh, but uh, we, we cannot really, uh, I mean, we, we, we're, we're not using 
Kubernetes actually for, for the workflows as I'm, I'm doing it now. Okay, there, there are a, com a couple of other questions on, for instance, this KSOPS plugin uh, for Argo CD um, and, and other uh, links. So hit me up in the chat, I can post them there. I don't think I, I will have uh, time for that. Um, maybe I take uh, like uh, one last question. So, um, so I mean, there was a question like, you know, what is the, what, what needs to be improved uh, for Kubernetes uh, to make it easier um, for, 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 for CERN or for high energy physics in general. And I said, you know, probably it's a multi-tenancy. Um, and um, I, I would say, uh, you know, the, the way that we do authentication and authorization is is um, also currently changing. So, so um, in principle, of course, each user should be able to create jobs in a, in a cluster, but for instance, not delete some other user's um, job. Um, and uh, so, so in principle, each user needs to have their own uh, dedicated namespace that need to be authenticated, for instance, via um, OAuth in one way or the other, but let's say most of the work's actually happening in, in the terminal. So this needs to be linked. Uh, and that's uh, currently giving me um, some kind of headache, even though, I mean, there are solutions, but this needs to be figured out. All right. so. Um, I see we're out of time. So thank you again very much uh, for, for joining this presentation. I hope you found it useful. And um, I'll be um, monitoring the, the Slack uh, chat for um, further questions. So have a great day. Thank you.